we look back at the race for Indiana's open governor's seat ahead of next year's elections. A big Republican field, the presumptive Democrat, and the issues coming to the fore on this special episode of Indiana Week in Review. Indiana Week in Review is made possible by the supporters of Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations. From the week ending July 14th, former Indiana Attorney General Curtis Hill, whose law license was temporarily suspended while in office when the state Supreme Court ruled he criminally battered four women, is running for governor. Hill joins a crowded Republican primary for the open seat. Hill had been seen as a rising Republican star before allegations that he groped four women, including a state lawmaker, at a late night party in 2018. Despite facing calls to resign and having his law license suspended for a month, Hill remained in office before losing re-election at the state Republican Party convention to current AG Todd Rokita. Hill also lost a bid for Congress last year in a private Republican caucus to replace the late Jackie Walorski. In a statement, Hill says he's running for governor because people want a proven conservative leader who is not beholden to Washington, D.C. or special interest groups. U.S. Senator Mike Braun, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch, and Fort Wayne businessman Eric Doden are among the other announced Republican candidates. Mike O'Brien, we often, especially in a crowded primary, we talk about what's the lane? What's the lane to succeed? What is Curtis Hill's lane here? Well, I think the presumptive right now lane is the religious right base, right, that, was, that went to bat for him at the convention, that, that, try, that tried to defend him when all these allegations were, were flying and either dismissed him as not that big of a deal or, you know, kind of said what he said that it never happened. Um, the question's going to be, in, 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 a fi, in a four or five way race, though, with a lot of money in it, um, you don't need 51% of the vote to get the nomination. You need like 30, right? And so, and, and maybe so, not even that, honestly. It, yeah. In a, yeah. in a, with four serious candidates. Yes. Right. With yeah, with that many serious candidates spread across, you know, all of that. And, and with so the question is going to be for that part of the base. Do they still have gas in the tank to keep defending this guy? And do they are they still kind of holding on to that? And there's enough energy behind that to rally around them, if they don't see another option. Which isn't may not be true either. You, yeah. you may go see another option in a Mike Braun. You know, Doden maybe Chambers comes in. Brad Chambers, the head of IDC, uh, maybe he comes in. Those guys kind of fill a business role, and Mike Braun certainly is central yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. um, but he's also, you know, pretty far right on the you know, as far as the base is concerned. So if that part of the base doesn't see another alternative, then they could rally around Curtis Hill. I don't see that delivering the, the election for him. But that's the best. That's the best shot he's got. In, t in terms of thinking about Curtis Hill's lane, I, I agree that it, it does feel like the far right of the party, which is a significant part of the party in this state, um, right. didn't have an obvious candidate yet. Maybe Mike Braun, not really Eric Doden. Suzanne Crouch has certainly tried to lean that way in her social media campaign, right. but that's relatively new, and I don't know that she has the roots in that community the way Curtis Hill does. Right. But at the same, and, and, and I think it was interesting in the statement I got from the Hill campaign on Monday when he announced, he used the words Washington, D.C., I think, three times. Mm -hmm. So is it Mike Braun that he's clearly going after right now? Um, possibly. I mean, I, I have to say my comments on Curtis Hill are going to be pretty brief because I have Curtis Hill fatigue, if not Curtis Hill exhaustion at this point in time. Um, and I think the most I'm time... I we agree. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was going to say, I mean, I, I spent considerable time reading all of your tweets from his hearings, um, both of your tweets from his hearings, and that was about as, as much as I've had of Curtis since then. Um, I, it, I agree with Mike on the fact that he is going to try and get that far right piece. And stranger things have happened in Republican primaries. I mean, we all knew with um, uh, when Richard Lugar lost, for example, in that primary. And we know how primaries can be um, on both sides of the aisle. Um, I just, I, you know, I've been in this business long enough to know that massive egos often outweigh common sense. Um, and they often, shame. yeah, shame. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all those things. I mean, and, and so I, I just don't know if he's going to be able to raise the money that he's gonna to have to raise to be competitive. I know a lot of people will say, I'm going to 92 counties, I'm gonna, this is gonna be about grassroots, but he's gonna to have to have a lot of money and he's mm. gonna be up against some really um, strongly funded folks in the primary. And then you've got Suzanne Crouch who basically rolls out an endorsement every day well, or every other day. Genuinely, so, genuinely just about every day. Yeah, like. so I, I think his, I, I don't necessarily know how his path is gonna look, but he could complicate things and that can be really a pain for Republicans. It feels strange and sad to say this, but I don't think the allegations and the, the law license suspension and all of that will be the thing that hurts Curtis Hill the most in this primary. 
Nikki, will it be the fact that he's not just facing three people who will have money, he's facing three people right now who already have a lot of money? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have a ton of money, and, and he's got a lot of you know ground to make up moving in this late with having some baggage. Um, you know, I do think he's he's sort of banking on, you mentioned him mentioning the Washington, D.C. a lot. He's banking on sort of this national tenor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, he and it, it's almost like he's running for attorney general of the nation instead of governor of Indiana. You know, he's announcing on Fox News Digital and he's doing all these sort of national conservative hits. Um, so he's trying to, I guess improve his name ID and maybe well, and draw some money from outside And not Indiana. just money, but that gets his face out there to yep. hopefully the kind yeah. of audience here right. in Indiana that he's seeing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so making, making use of the fact that he doesn't right now at least have as much money. Yeah. Uh, let me say this, though. Um, will he have to face head on what happened while he was in office? The fact that he, you know, the, the court said he, yeah. he criminally battered these women. Will he have to face that head on in this primary? Or can he largely ignore it if that's the route he decides to go? I think he can try. But if I'm his opponent, I'm going to bring it up mm -hmm. as much as I possibly can. And I think that is definitely a weak spot for him. So uh, why wouldn't I take advantage of that? Um, but to your point about the Washington, D.C., I thought that was really strange because I was like, who is he talking about exactly? Who is he signaling to that he, but you've gone on Fox, nothing you've done is about Indiana. So, but you want to be the governor of Indiana. But I definitely think that um, his past is going to come back to haunt him. He can try to ignore as much as he wants to and pretend that it doesn't exist, but I think his opponents are definitely going to use it against him. We had a pretty crowded field at this point in 2003. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Mitch came in and kind of cleared that field. Murray Clark, you know, a lot yeah. of these guys were, um, David McIntosh were all, were all mm -hmm. kicking the tires, Luke Kenley, were all kind of kicking the tires on, on the governor's race. And, and what Eric Miller's entrance into that kind of had this moment where it was like, oh, we got to consolidate the same people yeah. into mm. one guy, you know, and mm. Mitch was clearly the guy that, that everybody wanted to consolidate into. So Curtis does bring this element of, let's get to the end of the year and maybe Doden and Chambers are sitting in single digits, chamber, you know, uh, Hill's sitting at 20, all this is theoretical. You know, Suzanne and Braun are both doing well and, and competing, but you're, there, there could be an argument later that like, hey, we can't scatter this vote five ways. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Because we could wind up with them. Mm -hmm. The other thing too, though, is he could also be trying to burnish his national profile. I mean, he may be angling yeah, for, he may be angling for a spot on that's Fox News. Yeah. Like he may be trying to be a Fox News yeah. commentator at this or, point or in time. Or in a potential Republican administration yeah. yep. after the next election yeah. if that yep. happens. Yeah. 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 From the week ending August 18th. Indiana's crowded Republican primary for governor has another candidate. Brad Chambers, who recently stepped down as Indiana Secretary of Commerce, threw his hat into the ring this week. Chambers served two years running the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, and he says that service is helping drive his decision to run for governor. In a statement announcing his bid, he repeatedly uses the word vision, emphasizing that Indiana needs someone with urgency and ambitious aspiration to help lead the state. Chambers helped oversee a shift in economic development strategy at IEDC, with a recent emphasis on spending hundreds of millions of dollars to buy up land and prepare it for companies to locate on without knowing whether that investment will pay off. Prior to his time in state government, Chambers led a real estate investment firm for decades. He now joins a GOP primary that includes U.S. Senator Mike Braun, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch, Fort Wayne businessman Eric Doden, and former Attorney General Curtis Hill. Destiny Wells, considering who's already in the field, including an independently wealthy former head of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, <laughs> does a Brad Chambers run for governor make a lot of sense? I think probably in the echo chamber of the establishment that he's listening to right now, it does make sense. Um, you have a lot of candidates. It's fractured, and so maybe somebody with no low name ID like Brad Chambers, it would make sense. However, um, I'm not sure that he's going to resonate with a lot of the electorate outside of that establishment. You know, uh, if you are known for um, taking farmland, uh, stealing water, uh, you may not resonate with uh, rural Indiana. So I, you know, billionaire. Brad may have some problems when it comes to rural Indiana. I feel like so many things I could use to describe Brad Chambers, I can use to describe Eric Doden, who's been in this race for two years. What does Chambers see that the rest of us don't seem to think, don't seem to see? 
Well, first I'd say it seems like the Democrats are worried about him, so there's, we could start with that. Um, you know, I, I think that because there are four, now five candidates in this race, and some have been in for months, some have been in for years, but yet it's interesting that it still feels like a pretty wide open race. Um, you haven't seen any significant consolidation. So there's, uh, I think there's opportunity for a new candidate to enter. There are you know, multiple paths to victory, I would estimate, and, and think about just the numbers. Uh, depending on how it goes, you know, you may not have to have 50% of the vote. You may not have to have what those numbers are. Well, you know, is, is going to be really telling. And, you know, he's just coming off of a two-year stint overseeing the state's most significant economic development and job creation in state history. So, um, so the contrast with them obviously is the most recent, um, you know, last couple of years versus a record previously, but. You know, I think there are there are several strong candidates who have a case to make, but it's it's pretty clear that after this amount of time, there's still opportunity, and I would expect that he's surveyed that. When when Curtis Hill joined the race, in addition to some other stuff we talked about with Curtis Hill, we talked about who should be most worried of the of the candidates who are already in of Curtis Hill taking support away from them to himself. Should Eric Doden be really concerned here? Conventional wisdom would suggest that that is, let's go back to the, to the terminology that you used and set the stage with this discussion with, and that is lanes. They're both, if this were a swim meet or a track meet, they're both jockeying for the same set of blocks or the same, um, what everyone calls a spring meet. What do you call it at a swim meet? It's been a while, but with that, the same uh, place you jump off to start the uh, sure. technical term, if we, if we may. And, and that's, that's where, uh, that would seem to be the message, not just the message, but the credentials, the background, very similar uh, with the two of them in terms of their, their focus on economic development and making sure that Indiana is well positioned for economic growth. Obviously, Brad Chambers, he already has started, will make a lot out of. He's just finished running two years of the IEDC. Look at all of the jobs. Look at all of the commitments we brought in. Look at all the investment we brought into Indiana. But unlike a lot of heads of IEDC in the past, Destiny pointed this out, that strategy has not come without pissing some people off, quite frankly. Maybe not a lot of people, but it's made some people upset. Is that going to be a problem for Brad Chambers? Yeah, I mean, one thing in, in their own press release they counted as a success was launching the LEAP district in Boone County. Well, first of all, I mean, it, it, we don't even have a single job out there yet. So we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to buy land. They are... They are voluntary sales, but obviously people in Boone County have felt pressured. Um, we've spent a lot of money on those land purchases, way above value. We still only have one commitment in that thing. And now you've added this billion dollar pipeline we're gonna build taking water, water from Lafayette to down to Indy. So that's definitely controversial. And I don't think we know in any way whether that's a success yet or not. Overall, to And we're me, not going to know before no, people are casting not. their votes next year. The, the key thing I see from Brad Chambers entering is, is he's the mystery. I know literally nothing. Someone asked me, is he stridently conservative? Is he more moderate? Is he, you know, socially conservative? I have no idea. He's a complete mystery, and in some ways he gets to, I guess, you know, use his money to define himself now. Yeah. From the week ending August 25th, this week, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch, who's running for governor, is backing a push to eliminate the state's individual income tax. That tax currently brings in about $8 billion a year for Indiana, a third of total state revenue. Crouch says she's pushing income tax elimination because she constantly hears from people who are struggling with inflation and the increasingly high cost of living. Making up for the loss of so much revenue, she says, will require a holistic approach. We're going to look at cutting government spending. We're going to look at limiting government growth. We're going to look at finding efficiencies within government. What programs or services might be on the chopping block? She won't say. She also won't delve into specifics on how she wants to modernize the tax code as part of her plan. The how isn't as important as the what. And the what is we are going to eliminate income tax 
A legislative task force is currently examining the state's entire tax system. Crouch says she'll watch closely the results of that effort. Is this a good idea? Huh. Well, it is certainly a flashpan idea coming out of a primary, quite frankly, earlier than I thought something this sweeping would come out. So that's the surprising thing to me, where you've got a crowded primary, it's already been contentious, and already we're throwing something this grand. Well, I mean, the primary started there. a lot sooner, I suppose, <laughs> than the normal. That, yeah. that is fair. Adjusted for that. <laughs> so, but, but you've got the politics and the policy side of this, right? So politics, okay, we're all talking about it. Um, the, the policy side, to not have details about how this would be done, um, to take $8 billion out of our revenue to, that, that's a whole year of school funding. This isn't something that happens overnight. There is a current committee, the uh, task force, they met this week that this that is setting this. You don't just eliminate the income tax. Not to mention we have spent the last 15 years just focused on tax breaks. Uh, if the attention, intention with this is to help families because of high inflation, we should be investing in Hoosier families. We should be switching to a model we, where we are investing in public health, in public education. We haven't been doing that because we've been so focused on the tax breaks. Um, so, you know, that's the policy side. On the political side, um, it's some flash pan politics. We're talking about it, and I think that's the intent. The how is not as important as the what, and the what is eliminating the state income tax. When you're talking about eliminating $8 billion, and that's just right now, by the time we would actually do this, it will be probably closer to nine or even ten if things continue to go well. The how seems pretty important, does it not? Sure, but we're in the what part right now of the, of the cycle. And we have been investing in all the things that Elise just said, which is why, in part, we are talking about tax cuts again, because we've been, we've been awash in kind of an obscene amount of surplus money, a large portion of which they, they spent down. I'm trying not to revel too much in the fact that the Indiana Democrats and Curtis Hill both agree and Curtis Hill, the conservative in the race, the so-called conservative in the race, came out and said, how are you going to replace all this revenue? That's not the conservative part of cutting taxes, where we make the government whole. You have to experience pain on the government side if you're, trying to, if you're trying to deliver relief to the people you're trying to deliver relief to in inflationary times. This is very similar to me uh, in the conversation about property taxes. Same dynamic. How are you going to do it? We can never do it. It's too, it's, it's too expensive. It's going to hurt too much. Well, you go through that, but, but it was so necessary because people were losing their homes only because of their property tax bill. Um, and that was back in 2008, and, and, and we fixed that problem. And, but it took a number of, you had to turn a lot of dials to deliver that level of relief um, and also not, and not completely flush or put, put that much strain on, on state and lo local government. So I think the committee that met this week is going to look at all of those options, all of those dials that, that you turn and do what my favorite Mitch Daniels line, let's write a tax code like someone designed it on purpose. I mean, we already have a flat <laughs> regressive tax, though, when it comes to income tax. I just, this seems like the total elimination. Yeah, to that point, I was going to say, um, if you wanted to get, you know, she, I mean, she's right. People are struggling. Inflation, high, high gas prices, high prices at the grocery store. That is a real problem that people are absolutely struggling with. It seems to me that, and, and if you cut a tax, there is, a, there is pain on the government side. That's the way it works. It feels like there would be a lot of pain, not just for the government, but for people who count on government services if you just get rid of this tax. So why not move to a progressive income tax where you are helping people who, can't, who, who need the help more, and the people who don't need as much help would pay in a little bit more? Well, I guess the problem politically with adopting that kind of proposal is it doesn't get the same kind of bang for your political buck. Uh, if that were the case, yeah, we might be talking about it, but it wouldn't be as, wow, now that's a bold proposal. And it, it's surprising to me, yes, we, the, the, you would like to see more how in particulars and specifics. That, that's one thing, but we'll take that off the table for a minute. But if you looked at these candidates that are seeking the job and you said, who ranked them most likely to propose the elimination of the individual uh, income tax. I would put her maybe not at the bottom for the likelihood, but close to the bottom, because she's someone who has been a champion of government as a force for good in terms of the mental health arena, in terms of the delivery of, of human services. She chaired a task force, a round table, that looked at this issue for quite a period of time. These are issues that don't come cheap. The solutions don't come cheap. And the idea of attracting businesses, and even perhaps more importantly right now, given the state of 
of economic development, people and talent to the state, or keeping them here before they leave, um, that she believes, you know, you eliminate the state income tax, that's what's going to happen, is more businesses are going to come here, more people are going to come here. But increasingly, what we are told by businesses is that quality of place, the idea of making a place attractive to live and work in, not just to work in, but to live and work in, is the watchword of economic development. If you take away the government's ability to do things like trails and all of these, the important government services and then the quality of place government services, because those are the ones that go first when you're talking about slashing $8 billion, aren't you hurting yourselves with the very thing you think you're trying to solve? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. I, I give her credit for throwing down, you know, a bold idea for, you know, she's steering the conversation. Yeah. Her other opponents are having to now talk about it. Um, but the details from someone who's covered the nitty gritty of state budgets are important. And, and you know, she said, we're not going to raise any additional taxes. So then the idea of, you know, efficiencies, that's what we heard again and again, efficiencies. Look, I, I don't this kind of cracks me up about this conversation, is Republicans have been in charge for 20 years. Are there billions of dollars of efficiencies still in state government, or inefficiencies, and in, in, in if so, why? Because they've been in charge for 20 years. So acting like you can find billions in efficiencies is, is just not realistic. Um, and when you cut something, that means someone doesn't get a service, whether it means you have to go to the next county to the BMV, or you, you know, just various ways you interact with state government. So, but I, I appreciate the conversation. I've said for a long time, I want candidates to be making proposals yes. and let's talk about them, so. Oh yeah, this is absolutely Yeah, this is welcome. a proposal, yeah. yeah. From the week ending September 8th. Axios Indianapolis reported this week that a poll commissioned by Democratic gubernatorial candidate Jennifer McCormick shows her in a tight race or two with some of the Republican hopefuls. According to the Axios story, McCormick's poll of more than 600 registered voters put her in head-to-head -head matchups with three GOP candidates, U.S. Senator Mike Braun, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch, and former Attorney General Curtis Hill. McCormick trailed Braun 46 to 35 percent, trailed Crouch 39 to 35 percent, and was tied with Hill at 36 percent. McCormick, who served as Indiana Superintendent of Public Instruction as a Republican before switching parties, trails the Republican field significantly in fundraising. John Schwannis, taking any poll paid for by a candidate with an enormous grain of salt, as we always do, looking at all of the people who were mentioned in this poll, is Mike Braun got the reason to be the happiest with these results? I suppose better to be in the position he's in than, than, than second slot, third slot. But going back to a point that Nikki made a moment ago with the momentum she has seen and we've all seen uh, with the, the, the upstart in this, in this race, uh, the Chambers campaign, if that, you know, that was really not on the, well, on the he horizon. he hadn't even announced when he had not, So it was so not mixed in. Not a factor. So who's to say if we had the same campaign or the same poll conducted now, it would give the same results? I don't know the answer to that, obviously. But I guess to answer your question, better to be first place and the most uh, viable candidate. But you know what, These, to your point, polls at this stage, look, at we had CNN this week saying Nikki Haley was the only Republican at the presidential level who might be able to beat, or at least statistically, uh, could, be could beat Biden. Joe and Biden. she won't be the nominee. And she won't I, even I, be the nominee. I, I, yeah, something so. crazy would have to happen. Well, yeah. there's a lot crazy, point. yeah. But, but there's a long time until But that's the point of polls happen. right now. I mean, it's so fun to, to talk that about. End, if, you're, if you're Jennifer McCormick, You've put out a poll. You've decided to, you did a private poll that you've decided to talk to at least one press outlet about, knowing that it'll be reported elsewhere. And you're losing by what was it, eleven or twelve to one of the to one of the front runners for the GOP nomination. Explain explain the logic of that to me. Yeah, I mean, I think you just in their minds, you know, what a Democrat hasn't won a statewide elected position here in years, and so even if you show them near the top candidate. I mean, definitely showed her. Oh, yeah, right right by Crouch, right and, by tied Crouch with Hill. and tied yes. with Hill. So, you know, I think the most I would take from it is she has great name recognition, which I, I'm not too surprised by. She's our four years as superintendent of public instruction. And obviously. wasn't quiet during those four no, years. She not was, at all. Well she regarded. So um, that's something they can build on and maybe fundraise on. Yeah, yeah, to that end, is this poll really about 
proving to some people who you're trying to ask for money that, hey, I am I'm in biased. the race. I'm in the race. That's what it shows. She, it not only has name recognition, but she has positive name recognition. And I, I think that's something that she can market. The fact that Braun is a sitting senator can get, what, 36% of the vote? Yeah. Okay, is, is not an overwhelming endorsement of him. I think so, it was more than that, but yeah. Was it? I thought it was... I thought she had 36 and he had something. It's anyway, he, had a 10 he didn't have over 50. I wrote this story. It's not like I should remember the numbers. <laughs> yeah. the numbers are not our <laughs> game. Anyway, the, my, my point is that she shows that she's viable and, and she can raise the money. And we don't know that Braun's going to be the nominee. I, I've said repeatedly, I think it's going to be Suzanne Crouch, That's in true. which case it's a dead eat. To that point, I, and you mentioned it was too late for Chambers, or he hadn't announced yet before this poll was available. But I really would have been fascinated to see her numbers against like an Eric Doden. Not yes. saying that he's going to win, but you have one person with little to no name ID versus you. How do those numbers match up? I agree. If somebody that you might not be as familiar, yeah. you might not know well, his that, political standing as yep. well. Yeah. How do you match up with him? And I think that could have been. And that would be the same thing with Chambers, because I bet you if you put yeah, Chambers this, on that stage, poll, 10% right. could stage, do yeah. really yeah. But I think, I, I I think that could have been a, a better maybe talking point than showing yeah. yourself down. That's Indiana Week in Review for this week. You can find Indiana Week in Review's podcast and episodes at WFYI.org slash IWIR or on the PBS app. I'm Brandon Smith of Indiana Public Broadcasting. Enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend and join us next time because a lot can happen in an Indiana week. The opinions expressed are solely those of the panelists. Indiana Week in Review is a WFYI production in association with Indiana's public broadcasting stations.